I've never believed in urban legends, ghosts, paranormal, or anything like that. For the most part, I've always considered myself to be a rational, decent fellow. Not once did it ever cross my mind that devils or ghouls ever existed. Ironically enough, the small, old town I grew up in was chock full of them. I honestly could not believe how ignorant the people in my town were. They believed anything and everything that seemed like a logical fallacy. They embraced it wholeheartedly. They believed in healing rituals, dream catchers, and magical spells. And yes, my town was the epitome of superstition. Yes, as I had said, they were very ignorant to modern science. There were several legends surrounding my little town, including stories involving a woman seen weeping on a lonely road dressed completely in white, and cries of pain being heard from an unknown source at a location where there was a very severe car accident and several people were killed. And in all my years of being in this place, not once have I seen the lady crying in white or heard the groans of ghosts who died in an area. Naturally, I had begun to question these claims and ultimately concluded them to be false. And yet the townsfolk told these stories as if these things had happened to them personally, which I highly doubt. But there was one legend in particular that had everyone terrified, and for this reason, no one dared to enter the forest that night. My grandfather had informed me of this legend. Long ago, there was once a peaceful and benign Native American tribe who once inhabited the region we currently resided in. They had respected their land and one another and treated any guests with the utmost respect. When early European settlers entered their territory for the first time, the compassionate tribe welcomed their new visitors warmly, instructing them on how to raise crops and hunt for game. Subsequently, the Europeans repaid their services with cruelty, destroying their lands, spreading disease into their families, and selling their tribesmen for profit to the other settlers. To their horror, the tribe felt helpless as the Europeans arrived in vast numbers, violating their once sacred land. After watching his family grow and fellow tribesmen suffer agonizing deaths in the hands of the invaders, the chief of the tribe begged the Great Spirit for retribution. In a shamanistic ritual, he prayed that the foreigners had disgraced the land he and his people had treated so lovingly and he beseeched the all-powerful deity to exact revenge on them for all the pain they've caused. Shortly afterwards, the chief died of a disease brought over from the settlers. According to the legend, when the last member of the tribe had perished, there was still one patch of forest that had been untouched by the malicious settlers. This land was, according to the legend, the piece of land that the Great Spirit protected to honor the memory of the fallen tribe and its sorrowful chief. Whenever a foreigner was to travel into this particular forest at around midnight, they say a hideous, demonic being would attack them. And its most distinctive features was its voice. It would let out a scream so loud that it could demolish buildings. In some form of the rumors, they say that the scream drives people mad. Others say it can hypnotize whoever hears it. For this reason, the forest in which this creature inhabits has become known as the Screamer's Forest. Truth be told, as a kid, that sort of legend gave me chills. I knew there was one good possibility that a portion of it was factual. After all, I read several books detailing the accounts of the Native Americans, and in their words, describing the horrors of seeing their once sacred land wither away to nothingness. And although I felt pity on the tribe, I don't think that there was a demonic spirit protecting their land, as the legend claimed. Or so I had indicated. So, my friends... Frank, Joe, Phil, and I, we loved a good scare. 
We would often pull pranks on various denizens of my town due to their strong belief in the supernatural. Not ones that were too serious, just kind of silly ones. Even though we knew it was all fabricated, we enjoyed hearing tales of ghosts and demons. When summer was ending, we decided to do one final activity to finish off the season. We would be heading off to college again very soon, so we knew we wouldn't be having fun for a while. We decided to go on a camping trip. We couldn't go too far, so we settled on a campsite around our town. Just to add an extra scoop of excitement, we decided to rent a cabin right in the middle of Screamer's Forest, where the entity reportedly lurks. The next day, we packed up our food, clothing, and materials for the trip. When we drove towards the cabin campsite, we laughed and joked around about our daily lives and occasionally made cracks about the silly urban legend surrounding the forest. And finally, after about an hour, we made it to the forest. In all honesty, it was a very tranquil forest. Because of the townsfolk being scared shitless of the legend, we had the entire forest to ourselves. We heard the birds singing their colorful songs. All the creatures of the forest scurried along the trees and grassy floor, and the air had a cool, refreshing breeze. For a moment, I had no idea just what in the world had everyone terrified of this place. Quite frankly, it was one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen. I wouldn't have mind living here. My friends and I unpacked our belongings and set up camp. The cabin itself, although a little run down, was very cozy and comfortable. There was an upstairs bedroom where four people could sleep, just enough for the four of us. After the labor was done, we all went out and explored the forest. It was filled with wild flowers, colorful critters, and a lake that sparkled in the sun. It truly was a sight to behold. There was no photograph or image online I've seen that made this particular area look bland. We were having a lot of fun too, so it was only natural that we didn't notice the time. And the sun began to set, and the water turned from a crystal blue to a purplish color. We decided to head back and sit around the campfire before turning in. As we sat around the fire, still laughing and joking, we began observing our surroundings. In the daylight, the forest seemed tranquil and peaceful. But at night, it began to appear a little unsettling. The dancing flames in the center of our campsite illuminated the trees, making them appear like fiery monsters. I suppose the macabre scenery provided Frank with a little ghoulish inspiration, because he had suggested, Hey, what do you guys think of that legend? And that triggered a series of oohs and chuckles from the guys. They knew the story well. It was a popular one indeed. We began chattering about the screamer and what we thought it looked like what it did and what could possibly have caused all of this commotion over it. And just when it began getting entertaining, the flames began to die down. We all groaned because we liked the conversation. We were in the perfect environment for it. Ah, fuck. Right when it was getting good, moaned Frank, rolling his eyes and sighing heavily. Yeah, added Phil picking up a stick on the ground and throwing it at the flames, as if that were going to bring it back. This sort of shit happens all the time when things get good. Yeah, settle down, guys, I said, standing up, pulling my hoodie over my shoulders and reaching for the flashlight we had packed for the trip. I'll go get some. My friends all nodded their heads and exchanged words of agreement as I wandered my way into the dismal, lonely forest. Truthfully, I don't know just what the hell possessed me to go and get some firewood in the dead of night. Perhaps it was due to the fact that I still feared the legend of the Screamer, and I sort of wanted to prove myself that it wasn't real. Of course, that wouldn't be a hard thing to do because I didn't believe in any of that sort of rubbish. But that fear was still there, you know? That fear in which you think, 
it's okay, I've got this under control. But then you realize you're just trying to convince yourself that everything is going your way. In reality, you have no idea what the hell will happen, and you're scared stiff. I slowly marched my way deeper and deeper into the forest, looking for sticks and twigs to toss into the fire. I bent down to snatch up a few from the grassy, muddy floor. And that's when I heard it. That sound. That... Groaning. When I was picking up the shrubs and sticks, I heard something like a groan. Not a menacing groan, more like a groan that sounded as if it were in pain. A wail someone would make if they were recovering from a stomach ache or a broken bone. And I suddenly stood up straight, and for some reason, I instinctively shut off my flashlight. I suppose it was because I didn't want whatever was making that eerie groaning noise to detect me. The groaning continued for a moment. It sounded distant but still loud enough to be heard. My eyes slowly scanned the forest from left to right, trying to see if my eyes could catch some sort of movement in the darkness. It was there that I decided I'd have no choice but to turn on my flashlight. I just had to see whatever the hell was making those sound effects. I slowly lifted up the flashlight and flicked it back on. I carefully shined it on every nook and cranny of the woods, trying to uncover the source of those haunting moans. At first, I saw nothing but shrubs, bushes, and grass. When suddenly, I caught a glimpse of a tall, lanky figure in the shadows. I redirected my light towards the spot where I'd seen it standing. And indeed, I had seen correctly. At first, I didn't know what I was looking at. If I could describe it, it appeared to be very tall, a thin being with pitch black skin. On its head, I would visualize something that appeared to be long, snake-like hair. Fingers were long and branch-like, with long claws at the end of them. The most disturbing detail of this being, however, would have to be its eyes. Its eyes were glowing a fire engine reddish color, appearing vile, evil, and menacing. Its face lacked a nose and a mouth, or at least it seemed to be. Its head seemed to have been twisted in an impossible manner, as if something had tried to snap its neck or something. What was this thing? Was it even human? Was it some unknown species of animal? An alien? Was it someone playing a joke? I simply kept my flashlight anchored on the being, just watching as it stood there blending in with the darkness of the forest. And I then saw it take a very subtle step towards me. I felt myself flinch when it did that because by now, I had begun getting uneasy. And then, I heard that pain groan again. And that's when I realized that the groaning was coming from this... this thing. The monster groaned again, this time more prominently than it initially had. I shined my light on its face, trying to get a better glimpse of it. When I did it, I saw its long, lanky arm slowly reaching up to its head. It moved its arm slowly and agonizingly, as if it didn't want to make any sudden moves. It then grabbed its face and gruesomely turned its head to the correct position. I heard the bones in its neck cracking and snapping as it shifted its neck and head. The monster then slowly stood up straight, its eyes now completely focused on mine. For what seemed like an eternity, the being and I just stared at each other. My light still shining on its face, it just stood there panting slightly and peering into my soul. I remember my eyes shifting from left to right, not knowing what to do at this point. Then, something both odd and frightening occurred. The monster seemed to lean forward a little, just a little, and right when it did that, 
A powerful wind gust, practically hurricane force, began whipping me from behind, almost knocking me off of my feet. As the wind lashed at me, I glimpsed at the monster once again. Now, it was slowly beginning to lean backwards. What was it doing? Was it trying to suck me in? And finally, the fierce wind stopped. I managed to regain my balance and catch my breath. Then, one last time, I gazed at the demon in front of me. I then saw it slowly shift its shadowy head backwards, and I witnessed and heard the most unearthly thing I've ever seen in my life. The monster's previously blank face suddenly developed a colossal mouth that strongly resembled a trumpet. It had razor-sharp yellow teeth and a long, slithering tongue. It was hideous. And what was even worse is the sound that came out. Never will I ever hear something as demonic, frightening, or painful as that scream it made. When it opened its mouth, another volatile and vicious wind blasted me. This time, it was even more powerful than before. The trees rattled violently, the dirt off the ground began spraying all over me, and I could have sworn I even felt the earth shaking beneath my sneakers. Could all of this be happening because of the monster's voice? And then came that horrible noise. That noise would be with me until the day I died. Its scream started out resembling a siren, a high-pitched wail of sorts that became louder with every passing second. Then it slowly shifted lower in tone to a more human-like sort of screaming. A man's scream. Finally, the screaming reached its critical point. This time, the scream sounded like a combination of all three sounds. The wailing, the human-like screaming, and now it resembled an extremely loud groaning. A devilish groaning. The groaning sounded similar to a cruise ship's horn and a clap of thunder. And when it did reach that point, I felt myself collapse to my knees and I shut my eyes. I clamped my hands over my ears, trying to barricade that dreadful, ear-shattering noise that was vomiting out of that vile creature's mouth. That sound was unbearable excruciatingly painful. If I could try my best to compare it to something, I'd say it felt like two needles being forcefully shoved into my ear canals. I couldn't stand that fucking noise. If I sat there listening to it any longer, I would have surely gone mad. It's almost as if the noise itself wanted me dead. In the midst of all the pain and intensity, I opened my eyes slightly. I witnessed the creature still standing there, screaming and causing the entire forest to quake violently. And in the middle of all the insanity, I noticed that I had dropped my flashlight. With my ears still covered, I looked down and saw it on the ground. The gust of wind from the screaming was so powerful that I actually observed it rocking back and forth on its side. And suddenly, the glass shield in front of the light bulb shattered into a million pieces. The decibel level of the screaming must have been off the charts. And that's when I realized I needed to get out of there. If I stood here another minute, my ears would explode without a doubt. I slowly got to my feet. The screaming of the demon even made it difficult to walk. And I limped my way in the opposite direction of the beast. I slowly turned around to get one more look at it, and I couldn't believe that this entity had such powerful lungs. What was it? Where did it come from? Why was it doing this? I slowly sped my limping into a run and got out of there while still covering my ears. It was much more difficult to navigate my way around the forest this time around since I had abandoned my flashlight back where I had first witnessed the monster. And finally, just as mysteriously as it came, the high winds and the piercing in my ears suddenly ended. I screeched to a halt and whirled around. 
there was nothing there. The bizarre creature suddenly vanished. But how? Did I imagine all of it? It was impossible. I took advantage of this momentary silence and immediately dashed through the forest to locate my friends and try to get the hell out of here. For about five minutes, I frantically sprinted through the woods, searching for signs of our campfire illuminating the darkness. I was so close to giving up hope when I finally spotted a glinting orange light in the distance. Without hesitation, I scurried towards it as fast as I possibly could. As I drew nearer, the familiar chattering of my friends slowly came within earshot. Never did I think that I would be so relieved to have heard their voices. I felt a sense of security to hear them all. I charged through the bushes, panting and sweating from the very unusual experience I had back there. My friends all stared at me with curious expressions and their eyebrows arched. They began standing up and approaching me, and barrages of questions ensued. Whoa, where have you been? Yeah, where's the firewood? How come you're all sweaty? I bent over with my hands on my kneecaps, trying to regain my breath so I could explain just what the hell I had seen and heard. I... I... I said in between heavy panting. I saw... I saw a creature in the woods. A creature, inquired Joe, tilting his head. What kind of creature? I don't know, I replied, becoming slightly hysterical as images of that hideous beast clawed its way into my mind. It was this... this thing that was tall and skinny. It had these long arms and its voice. Oh man, I think you need to slow down a little. I slowly shook my head and swallowed a lump in my throat. D didn't, didn't you guys hear that sound? That, uh, that, that scream? The horns? My trio of friends all exchanged confused glances towards one another. And then they turned to me. Frank stepped forward to speak for them. He shook his head and answered, No, bro. We didn't hear any scream. I was speechless. How could they have not heard that dreadful wail? There was no way I could have imagined it. No way at all. But, but, I stammered as my head turned towards the heavy forested area. It was so loud. I thought my eardrums were going to explode. How could you guys have not... Hey... I think we'd better head off to bed, said Joe, putting his hand on my shoulder. You look tired. Frank and Phil both uttered words of agreement, and we headed inside the cabin. But how couldn't they have heard it? This didn't make any sense. Even though I was among friends, I felt so alone. They didn't believe a word I said. As I marched with them towards our cabin, I could see them whispering things, most likely about me. By now, they were probably thinking about packing up, going home, and registering me into an insane asylum. But I know I saw something out there, something evil, and I had the feeling it wanted us out. Inside the cabin, we climbed into our beds. My friends happily joked around as they changed their clothes, brushed their teeth, and streamed music on their smartphones. As for me, well, I was just lying in bed. I couldn't get that horrible, shadowy figure out of my head. What the hell was it? Where did it come from? Was it an animal, a human, a demon? All of these questions were furiously branded into my brain. Suddenly... That legend that my grandfather had told me came back into my head. More particularly, the entity known as the Screamer. Could it have been? Uh, could it have been that thing that I've seen in the forest? No, no, that was crazy talk. It's just a silly urban legend to scare off the local kids. 
or so I hoped. Finally, the guys finished up what they were doing and called it a night. Right before shutting off the light, they had given me a few words of confidence, and they said everything would be better in the morning. Those poor, poor souls. When the light dimmed and the darkness engulfed the room, I laid in bed staring at the ceiling. I still couldn't get that thing out of my head. That screaming, that horrible screaming was still ringing violently in my ears. As I gazed at the ceiling, I had lost track of the time. By now, I'd started hearing my friends beginning to snore quietly. I, on the other hand, was wide awake with my thoughts racing. I then sighed heavily, and then I began to slowly calm down. I know that what I had seen in the forest was unquestionably an oddity, but lying in bed all night worrying about what it may have been certainly wouldn't do anything for me. My nerves eased and I closed my eyes, trying to rid my mind of the thing I had seen. And just when I slowly started to settle down, I heard something outside. My eyes instantly shot open, every muscle in my body tightened, and my eyes swung from left to right. I even held my breath, trying to see if my ears weren't playing tricks on me. But yes, I heard correctly. I heard groaning, that familiar groaning from the forest. I felt a knot in my stomach, and a chill slithered down my spine. I felt my face twist in horror as I heard the groaning approaching our cabin. I heard whatever was coming, their feet scraping along the dusty grass ground. Hesitantly, I slowly creaked my head towards the window. But then, I suddenly changed my mind and turned my head in the other direction and shut my eyes tightly. I felt sweat beginning to trickle down my forehead. My breathing suddenly increased in speed and intensified. I quietly began mouthing a prayer. I wanted whatever was out there to go away. I then heard a thud, like something was hitting itself against the cabin's wooden walls outside. At least, that's what I initially interpreted it as it being. And then I heard it again, and again, and once more. Gathering any courage I had, my eyes slowly swung over to the window once again. I heard one more thud before seeing something I wish I hadn't. I saw a large, clawed hand appear on the window. I gasped, and I threw my sheet over my face, trembling like a leaf. Suddenly, I heard the window shatter violently. I threw the sheets off my face, and I looked. And there it was. That hideous demon from the forest stood on top of the broken glass, its crimson eyes glowing brightly in the darkness. My friends shot up from their beds, staring at this entity in disbelief. What the fuck is going on? I heard Phil shriek. What is this? I recalled Frank crying out. The screamer's cold, evil eyes slowly scanned the room, and its eyes landed on Joe. It slowly turned its head towards him. As it did, I heard the bones in its neck snapping and crunching multiple times. I just sat there in my bed, paralyzed with fear and disbelief. And for a moment, just a brief moment, I wanted to scream out, See? I told you, I told you I fucking saw something. That thought was quickly intercepted by what I had seen next. And what I saw happen to Joe will forever be engraved into my memory banks. Quicker than a bolt of lightning, the screamer leapt on top of Joe's head and snatched his neck. I recall hearing him coughing violently and seeing blood drip down his neck. His hands gripped the demon's wrist, a response to the sudden shock to his windpipe. The creature easily lifted him off the bed, and with his legs dangling in the air as if he were a large puppet. 
It held him just a few inches away from its face. The screamer leaned its head back, took in a deep breath, and it wailed right into Joe's face. And just like before, it had started out like a siren, then a human's wail, and then a low, ominous moaning. I felt my bed beginning to tremble violently, and I once again covered my ears to shield them from that sound. My eyes shifted to Joe just to see what was going on, and I couldn't believe what I was witnessing. The demon screaming was so loud that I saw the flesh on Joe's face beginning to peel off. First, his skin came off in small flakes. Then, as the screaming persisted, I saw the skin begin to go flying off in colossal chunks. Patches of flesh and skull began to reveal themselves. And finally, the entity stopped the wailing, and it slowly turned to us with Joe's bloody neck still in its clawed grip. It then seemed to hold up Joe's body in victory, as if trying to give us some sort of message. We all watched in horror as our friend's face bled, his jaw hanging lifelessly. The screamer then tossed his body aside as if he were a rag doll, and then turned to us its next victims. Frank and Phil both bolted for the door, and I did the same. The three of us dashed out of the room, into the hallway and down the stairs. As we sprinted down the steps, we heard that wail starting up again. The screaming shook the entire cabin, causing chunks of wood to fall off of the ceiling and the windows to rattle violently. Trying our hardest to resist the overwhelming pain of the intense shriek, we sprinted out of the cabin, leaving behind all of our stuff, and we dove into the car. Frank hopped into the driver's seat, Phil jumped into the passenger seat, and I got into the back seat. My friend jammed the key into the ignition and the car's engine roared to life. Without hesitation or minding the protocols of operating a vehicle, Frank slammed on the gas and sped out of there as fast as the car would go. I remember that right before the cabin vanished out of sight, I gazed back to stare at the cabin, and I saw the screamer crawl out of the entrance door, and its head shifted rapidly from left to right searching for us, just before disappearing into the darkness. I saw the demon's burning red eyes stare at us driving away. We all gasped and breathed sighs of relief, uh, thankful that we got out of there alive. Christ, uttered Phil, placing his hand on his chest and panting heavily. What the fuck was that? I don't know, replied Frank, keeping his eyes on the road, but I'm sure as hell not going to stay and find out. Yeah, you see, I said, still trying to catch my breath. I told you I saw some weird shit out in the forest. They both didn't respond, and I suppose they didn't want to admit that they were wrong. I shook my head and continued breathing heavily. Then, my eyes shifted to the rearview mirror. To my surprise and horror, I saw the screamer come sprinting right up behind us at a remarkable breakneck speed. I whirled around and saw its fire engine red eyes. Our car's taillights made them glow like cinders in a flame. Oh shit, I cried as I observed the demon coming in close. My two friends turned around to see it too, and then Frank stepped on the gas again. Get us the fuck out of here, screamed Phil as his eyes remained anchored on the screamer. For a moment, it appeared as though we would actually outrun it. The screamer seemed to slow down for a minute, still keeping up but at a further distance than it initially was traveling. And just then, it jumped high into the air, disappearing from sight. Where the hell did it go? asked Phil. We both began searching carefully for it, trying to see where it may have gone. And then silence. Absolute silence. Our car roared down the path, and for a moment, all seemed serene and tranquil. I took a quick glance at Frank, and I observed his worried face and eyes locked into the road in front of him. 
Phil frantically looked from left to right, trying to spot the horrifying entity that was apparently stalking us. And I turned once more, trying to see if I could make out the screamer in the faint light. But no, it was nowhere to be seen. Did we outrun it? Finally, I calmed down for a moment, just a moment. I sank back into the chair and I took a deep breath. Phil finally settled down into his seat, but I could still sense the fear within my friends. And we sat there, speechless. Probably because we were all too terrified to speak of what we had just saw. But then, the worst came. The screamer suddenly landed on top of the hood of our car. The vehicle bounced wildly a single time, and the demon's eyes were glowing that blood-red shade. An explosion of cries and profanity escaped our lips as the monster peered at us inside. It then raised its long, slim arm, and its hand burst through the windshield, and it seized Frank's face. I could hear Frank's horrified, muffled screams as the creature's clawed fingers dug into his cheekbones. As the car began swerving violently left to right as the monster impeded Frank's vision, I could see my friend grab the screamer's wrist and try to desperately rip away the hand on his face. But as hard as he tried, the being was far too powerful for him. Finally, the screamer tore his hand away from Frank's face, only to leave a patch of fleshy blood-stained skull and an eyeball dangling from a piece of flesh in its place. The creature roared that demonic growl for a second, and then it leapt off of our hood and into a place that I couldn't see, most likely the trees. The car made another violent swerve towards the left, and it crashed right into a trunk of a huge tree. Shards of glass went flying everywhere, and the body of the car shook violently. Oh shit, I groaned as I tore at the handle of the door to be let out. We gotta get the fuck out of here, man. I heard Phil yell madly. We both opened our doors and went sprinting out of the car and went separate directions. At this point, it was every man for himself. I darted straight into the dark forest, knowing full well that the risks that came with being in there. The screamer could very well have been waiting for us in there, and it would pick us off both like flies. Sharp branches from the surrounding shrubs and bushes scraped me as I scurried along the dense wooded area, away from the vehicle. As I dashed, I couldn't help but think of Phil. Where had he run off to? Was he okay? Would it have been better if we stuck together? I stopped for a moment to catch my breath. And for that moment, all seemed silent. And then all of a sudden... I heard a blood-curdling scream that made my hair stand on end. I immediately stood up perfectly straight, with my eyes wide and my mouth slightly agape. To my horror, I recognized the voice. It was Phil's. At first I heard just deranged, painful screaming, and then I began hearing some sort of bizarre groaning mixed in with those screams. I then heard Phil begin to urgently call my name begging for me to come to his aid. But I didn't move. I mean, when the fuck could I do besides just get us both killed? I just stood there, listening in horror as my friend was torn to shreds by this thing from hell. As the attack progressed, I could hear Phil's screaming become more garbled and deranged, to the point to where he was just coughing and gasping and possibly even vomiting, until finally the agonizing wails of my friend stopped. He was dead. I was the sole survivor of this trip. I took a deep breath and then quickly came up with a plan. The car, although damaged from the crash into a tree, was still functional. In fact, I could hear the engine still rumbling. I would bolt for the car and try to drive away as fast as possible. I know for a fact that the screamer was now hunting for me. I had no other choice. If I remained stationary, I would die. I peered through a few bushes and I could see that the car was still on, headlights still working alright, 
smoke slithering out of the tailpipe, and the engine still rumbling. Gathering all the strength that I could, I sprinted towards the vehicle. I could hear myself breathing more strained than ever before, and sweat poured down my face and my head in buckets. And finally, I reached my goal. I got to her car and I could still see Frank's dilapidated corpse sitting in the driver's seat. His face was mutilated and atrocious. But I know I didn't have time to feel grief over my lost friend, nor disgusted by the putrid wound left on him by that monster. I grabbed his corpse with one hand on the collar of his blood and sweat stained shirt, and the other on his shoulder, and I yanked his body out of the car. I tossed it onto the side of the road and hopped into the seat. The keys were already in the ignition, so all I had to do was reverse the car and get the hell out of this hellhole. As I was in the process of backing up the car and rotating the wheel, I suddenly saw it from the corner of my eyes. Two burning cinder-like orbs staring at me from the dark treetops. Without hesitation, I slammed on the gas and took off at full speed. My hands trembling while they were on the steering wheel, and my eyes remained anchored in the rearview mirror. I sat there praying as I drove, despite my agnostic beliefs. I needed to find comfort in something. I felt a cold grip of fear tighten around my neck and my heart racing as I saw the screamer's tall, lanky body come chasing after the car. I clenched my teeth and my hands on the wheel tightly as I saw its eyes glowing and it coming closer and closer. I then witnessed it crouch down as if preparing to leap. I knew what it was going to do. It performed a mighty hop similar to that of a frog's towards the car. I jerked the car quickly to the right, evading the creature. I saw it turn its hideous face in a somewhat flabbergasted manner. Then it tried another leap at me. I swerved to the left once again, dodging its attack. It went on like this for nearly 30 seconds, when suddenly it simply sprinted up beside me. The car was going as fast as it could, so I couldn't get away. The screamer then lifted its long, skeletal-like arm and slashed at my door's window. An involuntary reflex made me put my arm up to defend myself. The demon's claws scraped my arm, and a sharp, stinging pain shot up through it. I cried out in pain and stared at the three massive claw marks that served as my wound. Blood began oozing out of them, and I shook my head. Fuck! I screamed aloud as my hands got back on the steering wheel. The screamer then lunged at the side of my vehicle once again, and this time, it slashed at my face. I cried out once again and clutched my face, feeling blood beginning to ooze through the slits of my fingers. And suddenly, the screamer grabbed the car door and tore it right off of its hinges. It began to reach out towards me. I jerked the wheel to the right and evaded its grasp. Suddenly, the screamer stopped. I stared at it through my rearview mirror. It just stood there, tall and staring at me in some trance-like state. I blinked and took deep breaths. Why did it just stop? What did I do to make it stop its attack? As I sped down the road towards what seemed to be my escape, I suddenly felt it. That intense gust of wind and the loud, unearthly scream. I clenched my teeth and shut my eyes tightly as I braced for it. The scream, once again, caused my vehicle to rock from left to right as if I were driving in some intense storm. The windows of my car, or what was left of them, began to rattle. It shattered the remains of the windshield and the trees swayed violently back and forth. Dirt and rocks began to fly in the air, and my ears stung in such pain. And finally, after what seemed like an eternity, the howling stopped. I took a deep breath and peered at my now-cracked rear-view mirror. The screamer was nowhere in sight. My muscles relaxed and I leaned back into my seat. 
I drove home as quickly as possible to get away from this place. I parked my car right outside of my house and I barged inside. I shut the door behind me and I immediately collapsed onto the floor, exhausted and terrified by what I had just experienced. That thing, its long, slim body, its fire-red eyes, its hideous shrieks of terror. As I slowly drifted off to sleep, my final thoughts were questions regarding why it had stopped. I had thought about that legend my grandfather told me so long ago, and then it hit me. I got out of the patch of land that the screamer was assigned to guard. I survived simply because of a certain boundary. I now knew I would never venture into that forest again, because something was in there. A vengeful spirit or entity protecting the land of a Native American tribe was treated so poorly.